Good evening. My name is Matthew Walsh, Associate Professor of Biblical Studies here at Acadia Divinity College. On this third and final evening of the 2022 Hayward Lectures, it's my privilege to introduce our lecturer, Dr. Janine Brown, a New Testament scholar from Bethel Seminary in Minnesota. Dr. Brown was recently awarded the David Price Professorship of Biblical and Theological Foundations, and she is the author of several articles and books, including Scripture as Communication, which I might add is requi required reading here at ADC in our Old Testament and New Testament interpretation courses. Dr. Brown is a world-class scholar, but it has been great to learn a little bit about her family these last days. In chapel this morning, we heard about her love for her grandchildren, and we're glad that her husband, Tim, has been able to join her. What you may not know, however, is that the two of them initially met in a setting so romantic that it almost rivals Paris or Venice. Yes, they met in a seminary Greek course for which <laughs> Dr. Brown was serving as the teaching assistant. This is the, the stuff of Hollywood, folks. <laughs> The last two evenings, we've been introduced to the interpretive significance of embedded genres in the New Testament. We've heard about hymnic material in Philippians and riddles in Matthew. Tonight, the topic is household, co household codes in 1 Peter, pardon me. Please join me once again in offering Dr. Brown a warm welcome. So in preparing for this lecture, um, that was the bane of my existence, trying to say household code very clearly about 37 times or something like that. So we'll see how it goes tonight. Once in a while, I'll throw in domestic code because it's a lot easier to say. Even if you've never seen the show Father Knows Best, a Hollywood sitcom from the 1950s, the title communicates volumes about cultural values and norms prevalent in that era in the United States. The show's characterizations of its nuclear family, a father, a mother, two daughters, and a son, promoted what was considered at, at the time normal roles for parents and children, males and females. These kinds of norms would have also been reflected and enforced in the legal structures and civic discourse of that era. Everything from tax exemptions and laws that impacted marriage and um, children to, ch to literature and education to religious communities and as we've noted Hollywood would have both shaped and reflected cultural norms. I realize I've been describing what I know, my own U.S. context of the 1950s, though I have to demur by noting this was before my time, just before my time. Yet I can imagine you are quite able to envision how family norms have had particular expression in past and present, present Canadian society or wherever you might come from. My primary point in raising these kinds of examples is to indicate how norms and expectations for family life and even definitions of family are in the air in any particular epoch. We may not be actively aware of every avenue for pressures to conform to an ideal family and to perform the roles of ideal family members, but if we have lived in a specific context and era, which we all have, we will know and we will know implicitly what is expected of us in our functions and roles within the family. Tonight we look at our final genre within a genre. We turn to the letter of First Peter. Within this letter, we encounter a household code. Household or domestic codes in the Greco-Roman world were an important means of casting a vision for the ideal family in the, in the Greco-Roman world and pressing members of society toward conformity with that vision. These written norms were not exactly like the TV show Father Knows Best, but maybe surprisingly, they share in common with that TV show some general kinds of purposes and functions. The letter of 1 Peter is five chapters long, 105 verses, and 27 of these verses are devoted to a household code, chapter 2, 11 through 3, 12. 
This means that a full quarter of 1 Peter consists of this household code. More striking, the household code comes pretty much at the center point of 1 Peter. In fact, Leonard Gapelt identifies the wider middle section that includes the household code as the center and focus of the letter. So why? Why, if you're writing a letter to Christians in Asia Minor or Anatolia in the first century, what we know as modern day Turkey, why put a household code at the heart of your dispatch? That's a question that's intrigued me for years, and it's a question we're going to tackle tonight. It will involve getting to know what a household code in the world of the first century looks like, and it will mean diving into the issues of who these early Christians were and what in their situation and experiences pressed Peter to include and adapt a household code as a key strategy in his epistle. To begin, we'll want to get a general sense of the function of the household or domestic code in the Greco-Roman world. Why, generally speaking, does someone write or recite a domestic code? This kind of code communicates societal norms for ordering the household and the behavior expected of the individuals that make up the household. A domestic code, generally speaking, encourages compliance with these expected social norms. So the intended function of a household code, in a nutshell, is conformity. This is true of domestic codes in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, as much as it is true of modern codes that we see implicitly woven into the carriers of such norms, such as the media and civic discourse. Given this general nod to the conforming function of the ancient household code, we can back up and ask, ask why the audience of 1 Peter might have needed such a code, at least from the perspective of the author of the letter. Why might Peter consider it necessary for Christians in Anatolia to hear and engage a household code? So who needs to hear a household code? To help answer this question, let's take a look at the situation of the audience of 1 Peter as we glean it from the letter itself, from the internal evidence. We begin with the clues we get in chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. There, Peter writes, For you have already spent enough time acting as the Gentiles like to act, living in excess, evil cravings, drunkenness, reveling, carousing, and disgusting idolatry. They are astonished that you no longer join them in that same flood of reckless abandon, so they malign you. In this short description, two things become clear. First, the audience of the letter is primarily, though not completely, Gentile, and would have included people from various ethnicities and various past religious loyalties. We see this in the description of their previous lifestyle, which was characterized by idolatry. The last thing on the list kind of provides the climax and the lens through which to hear the rest of them. So they are characterized by idolatry and all the problematic behaviors Jewish people associated with worshiping pagan gods in pagan temples. A glimpse into the Gentile identity of the letter's audience has already been offered earlier in the letter, where the audience are, uh, the people in the audience are steered away from their evil desires when they formerly were in ignorance, and where Peter has described their salvation as a redemption from their useless way of life they inherited from their ancestors. A second reality of the letter's audience is illuminated in these verses from chapter 4. This group of Christians is being verbally harassed because they have disengaged from temple activities associated with their former gods. As Travis William proposes, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, reveals that prior to their conversion, some members of the audience had been involved in certain social activities or institutions, and upon conversion, they were no longer able to continue these practices. Their neighbors, friends, and as we'll discover, even some within their own household are surprised and concerned by their withdrawal from these religious and social activities. As a result, these other people, still committed to their gods, malign and verbally slander the Petrine Christians. And yes, that is a word, Petrine. It's the adjective that we get to use in Petrine studies. <laughs> 
uh, these Petrine Christians who have turned their back on those gods. This glimpse into the kind of mistreatment the letter's recipients are experiencing is confirmed over and over again across the letter of 1 Peter. We can see, hear it starting in verse or chapter 2, for example. Make sure your conduct is honorable among the Gentiles so that when they accuse you of doing what is wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of his visitation. For it is God's will for your community that by doing good you should silence the uninformed words of ignorant people. Do not pay evil, repay evil with evil or slander with slander. And then in chapter 4, if you are reviled for Christ's name, you are actually blessed. To gain an appreciation for the cost of withdrawing from temple expectations and activities, we need to understand the values and sensibilities of Greco-Roman religion and society in the first century world. The Greco-Roman pantheon, as well as locally specific ancestral deities, and the Roman imperial cult would have populated the religious landscape. What I describe in my commentary on Philippians about the socio-religious setting of Philippi also would have applied to first century Anatolia. I write, in such a setting, civic and religious expectations promoted loyalty to and worship of multiple deities, even if someone might maintain a preference for a special or a special connection to one particular god. What was little understood or accepted was allegiance to only one god, and that one not recognized as part of the Greek or Roman pantheons, as promoted by those who worshipped Messiah Jesus exclusively. When Christians proclaimed Christ and Christ alone as Lord, they were rejecting a primary religious and civic duty. Although temples provided a centralized location for cultic activity, temple influence and related expectations for religious and social life had a much broader impact. As Williams enumerates, cultic influence impacted everyday life through such varied means as guilds and associations, which were often very closely aligned with worship of the gods, public buildings and institutions with their inscriptions to the gods or the imperial family, and then festivals and games and other public rituals. Separation from these many and various activities would have attracted attention, to say the least, and would have labeled Christians as antisocial, antipolis, with the fallout being potentially economic and political as well as religious. In such a situation, Christians were susceptible to charges of wrongdoing and conduct injurious to the well-being of the commonwealth and to the favor of the gods. We can hear the difficulties arising from this scenario in 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 16, where the author writes, Do not be afraid of them. Do not be unsettled. But set apart Christ as Lord in your lives, being ready at every turn to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for your common hope. But do so considerately and respectfully, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. Setting apart Christ as Lord in their lives would necessitate a rejection of the lordship of other gods and would have placed these Christians in a precarious situation, one that seemed to have caused them to fear for their own well-being. Do not be afraid of them. Do not be unsettled, Peter writes. They might have feared for their well-being as they bore the brunt of this malicious slander that seems to be uh, mentioned any number of times by the author. The exclusivity of Christian worship was, in effect, a denial of the gods, as William puts it. He goes on to suggest that failure to worship the traditional gods bore certain implications for members of the entire community, the whole populace. If one member slighted the gods, it was believed, retribution could have been exacted upon everyone. So how does specifically a household code help this group of beleaguered Christians? I would suggest that the Petrine Household Code helps these Christians to walk the fine line between accommodation 
to cultural norms as much as possible and resistance to some societal expectations when absolutely necessary. If a household code typically presses for conformity, this particular household code, especially in its more unusual features, which we'll be talking about, also implicitly affirms the singular loyalty due to Christ that inevitably has placed these Petrine believers in a difficult and potentially dangerous situation. And Peter gives them a household code, not least because the dividing line of allegiance seems to be running right down the middle of some of these Anatolian households. This reality becomes clear as Peter directly addresses slaves whose masters are harsh, not just the kind ones, and wives whose husbands are unbelievers. As we'll see, this puts these slaves and these women who have set apart Christ as Lord, as the object of their singular loyalty, it puts them in a potentially perilous position in their homes. We can go all the way back to Plato to illuminate the genre of the household code. An important connection that Plato makes involves an integral relationship between the household and the state, or the polis, the Greek word for state. Plato proposes that the household and the polis are organized under the same principle of rule. For example, he refers to the matter of ruling and being ruled alike in the states, large or small, and in households. Then Plato distinguishes between those who would rule and those who are ruled when he writes, the better are the superiors of the worse, and the older in general of the younger. Therefore, also parents are superior to their offspring, men to women, and children, rulers to ruled. Aristotle, a student of Plato, focuses on the relational pairings that form the core of the household, and he defines them as master and slave, husband and wife, father and children. You may have noticed that the ancient household is described in somewhat different terms than the household as conceived in contemporary Western societies. Not only would the ancient household have include a wider array, included a wider array of groups, um, including multiple family generations potentially, and slaves, as Aristotle notes, it also very often functioned as a locus of economic activity. So not surprisingly, Aristotle sometimes wove into his three relational pairs an additional economic category related to household wealth. The three pairs Aristotle references in his politics should sound familiar to readers of the New Testament, given the framing of the two domestic codes in Ephesians and Colossians, both of which include these three pairings of master and slave, husband and wife, father and children. Aristotle writes elsewhere in his politics, it is part of the household science to rule over wife and children. Notice that this address is framed for the male head of household. This is an important feature of the Greek and Roman domestic codes. In most cases, guidance and norms are addressed and given to the one who rules. The male head was expected to exercise authority over his wife, his children, and his slaves, even if in somewhat distinctive ways to each that, that was commensurate to each particular relationship. Now you could say Plato and Aristotle, Aristotle lived and wrote hundreds of years before the New Testament. So could we really expect the household guidance provided by these philosophers to still have purchase by the time of the writing of 1 Peter? David Balch in his seminal work on the Petrine Household Code has shown that both Plato and Aristotle came to be read and cited in the decades leading up to the first century of the Common Era, mostly, most likely through the influence of handbooks that contained salient portions of those earlier writings. This recirculation of the work of Plato and Aristotle focused, among other things, on their discussions of household management. In other words, the governing of relationships within the household and the philosophical rationale for such ordering. David Balsh points to the Roman writers Dionysus, Arius Didymus, and Seneca, each of whom wrote sometime within the first centuries before and after the Common Era, to show that the kind of ethic found in the New Testament household codes was important to the Roman aristocracy. 
We can also see the influence of the legacy of the household code genre on Jewish writers, such as Philo and Josephus, who lived and wrote during the first century of the Common Era. Both expressed the traditional hierarchical view of the relationship between husbands and wives. For example, Josephus, pointing to the Torah, argues, let the wife accordingly be submissive, not for her humiliation, but that she may be directed, for the authority has been given by God to the man. Philo expresses similar sentiments and actually uses language of servitude for the wife's stance toward her husband. We, we can set these responses in, the context, in context by noting Roman critiques of Judaism during this time for its destabilizing and even subversive influence. For example, the Roman politician Tacitus describes the Jewish people in this way in his histories. He writes, the Jews regard as profane all that we, Romans, hold sacred. On the other hand, they permit all that we abhor. Josephus and Philo may very well be responding to these kinds of critiques by emphasizing traditional mores and expectations. These Jewish contributions and the setting in which they arise are suggestive for our understanding of the New Testament domestic codes, which can also be understood as responses to external political and social critiques of the Christian community and concomitant pressure toward conformity. While we've been addressing and noticing the patterns of similarity between classical domestic codes and those of the Roman era, it is important to recognize that not all first century Greco-Roman writers follow Plato, Plato and Aristotle in every regard. Some later Greek and Roman writers did express more egalitarian impulses that were evident in that then that were evident in the earlier forms, those earlier writers. For example, Plutarch and some Roman Stoic philosophers. Seneca, one such Roman Stoic philosopher, wrote during the first century, suggests a certain kind of reciprocity in the relationship between husband and wife, master and slave, parent and child, at least in terms of the equal demand upon both parties to provide benefit to the other. Nevertheless, the movement is not a simple unidirectional one from hierarchy to egalitarianism. As we might expect, the actual picture is more complex. Even writers contemporary to the New Testament who exhibit impulses in the direction of greater equality continue to reflect the consistent pa patriarchal pattern seen in Aristotle the Neo-Pythagoreans, and in Roman Stoics. And that's Balsh's conclusion. In the main, within Greco-Roman philosophy and rhetoric, the male head of the household, in Latin the pater familias, had the authority over his wife, children, and slaves, and he was expected to exercise that authority. As these writers reflect on household management, their writings are intended to promote conformity to these ideal hierarchical relations. And while the reality of household relations would have inevitably been more complex than male free philosophers would have liked to have admit, the force of the general contours of the ancient domestic code would have routinely shaped expectations and behaviors. Now, before turning to the Petrine Domestic Code, which I know we're excited to get there, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, I want to note again a distinctive feature of the various discussions on the topic of household management, namely a close connection drawn between the household and the state. Plato highlights this connection and Aristotle affirms it as well. For these two and for various later writers dependent upon them, good citizenship in the sphere of the household helps to ensure the same in the polis. For instance, Gaius Masonius Rufus, writing in the first century, a Roman Stoic, understood the home in terms of the welfare of society. Masonius insists that it would be each man's duty to take thought of his own city and to make of his home a rampart for the city's protection. As we will see, the way Peter begins his household code in 2.13 through 17 suggests that this integral connection between household and state is being assumed for his readers and their context. All right, now we get to come into the text of 1 Peter. And now that we have a solid sense of what ancient household codes typically looked like and what their purposes were, 
we can consider our reading strategies for First Peter as we move from the overarching genre of letter to the specific subgenre of household code at 2.11 and following. Then we'll explore the Petrine Code to see where and how it might fit the genre parameters as well as bend and expand genre expectations for household codes. The context preceding the household code in First Peter involves some typical elements of the genre of letter, including exhortations to the letter's specific audience and affirmations of their new identity as the people of God. Both exhortations and affirmations are situated in light of the particularly trying circumstances of these Anatolian house churches as they experience the push and pull of societal forces, some of which are deeply at odds with their newfound allegiance to Jesus the Messiah. After the letter's opening, Peter gives a number of initial exhortations to his readers to live distinctively within society and in line with their hope in Christ. He follows these admonitions with key affirmations of the audience's identity as the people of God, using such metaphors of their identity as God's people, or God's temple, a priesthood, and a holy people. This first major section of the epistle then leads into the household code, 2.11 through 3.12, and then immediately following the code, Peter provides a clearer picture of the audience's situation of being slandered by others for their allegiance to Christ while also encouraging them to reflect on whether they can ameliorate that slander by living even more more concertedly an irreproachable life. Focusing on the household code itself, let's begin by noticing a few ways the Petrine domestic code lines up closely with expectations of the genre. First, we can see that two of the three paired relationship categories are rep- represented in First Peter, slaves and masters, and wives and husbands. Missing are instructions to parent of parent to child, as we see in Aristotle's three pairings and in Ephesians and Colossians. Second, the calls for slaves and wives to submit to the pater familias in 1 Peter 2.18 and 3.1 are quite in line with domestic code expectations for the male head of the household to exert their authority over wives and slaves. Third, the frame of the Petrine household code explicitly highlights the apologetic nature of the code which is similar to Jewish appropriations of the ancient household code form to demonstrate that Jewish faith was not at odds with Roman authority and expectations and was not, therefore, a threat. The Petrine Code frame focuses on the theme of pursuing good conduct and non-retaliation to avoid further conflict with societal norms. These alignments with ancient household codes are important to notice, but they are the unmarked features of the household code. Since they align with expectations, they would not have stood out to the original audience particularly. Instead, they indicate the ways in which the Petrine Code mirrors or resembles closely the anticipated household code genre. Hermeneutically, we should pay special attention to the marked features of the household code, those that stand out because they defy normal parameters and expectations of this genre. It is the marked features that are especially important hermeneutically. One of the marked features of the Petrine Code is the extent of the direct address to household slaves and to wives. As we noted, the pattern of the ancient household code was to address the male head of house to guide their rule of the rest of the household members, wives, slaves, children. Less common was the use of direct address to those members with less power in the system. And for slaves to be directly addressed was highly unusual. So direct and lengthy addresses to slaves, eight verses, and wives, six verses, with no corresponding words, words to or about masters directly, and only a short address to husbands, one verse, these features are unconventional. Additionally, the absence of any address to fathers, or address to fathers in relation to their children is unusual as well. Shively Smith calls it a conspicuous conspicuous silence in the letter. 
Smith suggests that the author of 1 Peter omits this section for his household code and instead locates the child-parent relationship and language within the household of God. That's Peter's term at 417. In this household of God, in which God is the father of all believers, then the children are together children and siblings. Because of this new reality, this new birth, as Peter says in 1.3, those who are loyal to Jesus are siblings together in God's house with God as their father. These features, direct address to those with less power in the Petrine households, and the omission of a section devoted to the parent-child relationship are marked or atypical features of the household code. Another unusual feature of the Petrine Code is the opening section addressed to all members of the Christian communities, exhorting them toward submission to the governing authorities. Yet this rather anomalous first segment of the code, it doesn't look like what we see in Ephesians or Colossians, for example, taps into the deep-seated connection in philosophical discourse between state and household, polis and oikos and it accents the political tone of the Petrine household code. As Greek philosopher Plutarch remarks, a man ought to have his household well harmonized who is going to harmonize state, forum, and friends. We could say that this political feature, though we're gonna talk about it as more than that, of the, of the code is marked due to its explicit presence at the front of the code. As we take a closer look at the Petrine Household Code, we'll continue to be attuned to its marked and unmarked features in relation to the Greco-Roman genre of domestic codes. So let's begin with the first segment of the code addressing submission to governing authorities. First, or given its position at the front of the household code proper, Peter locates his domestic code in the context of the socio-political situation and stance of his Christian audience. This fits the integral connection assumed in, Greco -Roman, in the Greco-Roman world between the household and the state, where insubordination in the one led to insubordination in the other. Peter writes, submit yourselves to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether to the emperor as the one who holds the highest place of authority or to governors as those who are sent by the emperor to punish wrongdoing and to approve doing good. For it is God's will for your community that by doing good, you should silence the uninformed words of ignorant people. Live as those who are free, not using your freedom as a guise for evil. Instead, live as slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. What we see in this first segment, which is addressed to everyone in the Petrine congregations or house churches, is an exhortation to compliance to expected norms of submission to the state. Submit yourselves to every human institution, whether to the emperor or to the governors. It is significant that Peter specifically identi identifies the emperor, using Basileus, as well as the local governors who would have been a visible presence of the authority of Caesar in Asia Minor. This explicit identification accents Roman occupation and authority for these Christians of various ethnicities. And Rome was not shy about emphasizing its might and its giftedness to rule other peoples. Listen to Virgil's lines in, from the Aeneid, this Roman poet's epic poem that would have been well known across the empire. Do you remember, Roman, to rule imperially over the nations, these shall be your skills, to set the force of habit upon peace, to spare those who submit and crush and war the haughty. To spare those who submit points to the ideal good subject of the realm. The core value was to promote loyalty to Rome. The common fate of all Rome's subjugated peoples, including the Petrine audience, was their required fealty to Rome, to Caesar. Given Rome's ultimate control and authority and Caesar's claims of lordship, how do these believers live out their allegiance to Jesus as the one true Lord? The rest of the paragraph in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 suggests the way forward for them. We can note that the command to submit is unmarked 
which means it fits expectations and does not press against genre boundaries. Yet, even the way the author frames the exhortation to submit already has a limiting effect on the scope of the authority granted to the emperor and his delegates. By referencing the broad category of anthroponeicatesis, human institution or human creation, Peter has identified the emperor and his representatives only as human creatures, and so implicitly denies any claim that the emperor is theos, divine. Peter follows up the command with a series of explanations and exhortations that illuminate the social pressures being experienced by his audience and that confound societal norms for appropriate political behavior. Peter follows up the call to submission with an explanation that by doing so, his audience might silence the uninformed words of ignorant people. Verse 15, this motif fits what I earlier described as the circumstances of the letter's recipients. They are experiencing verbal slander from neighbors, friends, even family members for their new loyalty to Christ. Now the, the marked features of this part of the household code come in the exhortations of verses 16 and 17. First, Peter guides his readers to live out their submission in the polis as those who are free, hos eleutheroi. This is a striking identification for people who are living under Ro Roman occupation, and it envisions a different possibility than simple acquiescence to Roman power. It empowers though with little those with little political capital to reconceive their identity in line with God's salv salvific actions and perspective, a task the author has already begun to do in chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Even as Peter provides this potent vision for their identity as free people, he qualifies it, and he qualifies that freedom, writing, not using your freedom as a guise for evil. Instead, live as slaves of God, verse 16. We hear in this juxtaposition the pressures facing the Petrine community and the Petrine audience to live out their new identity and allegiance to the one true God while avoiding as much as possible accusations of antisocial, antipolis behavior. As we've seen already in chapter four of First Peter, these accusations are already being leveled at them. What is pronounced about Peter's exhortation is that their identity as free people with respect to the state is to guide or to, to be guided by their identity as slaves with respect to God. And it is this divine relationship, not their relationship with Rome, that keeps their behavior in check. This is not something we'd expect to hear in Plato or Aristotle or those who followed their lead. A second marked feature come of the code comes in verse 17 where Peter provides four short and coordinated exhortations for relating to various others. Honor all people, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. What stands out among these four exhortations for our purposes is the equalization of the first and fourth entities. Honor all people, honor the emperor, tamao in both cases. In this schema, the emperor is not granted a posture any greater than what is due every other person, and certainly not the fear and reverence, the phobos, reserved for God alone. In a context in which honor is given in decidedly different amounts to different groups and people, this egalitarian stance toward all people, Caesar included, is nothing short of astonishing. The household code moves to address slaves specifically in 2, 18 through 25. And as we've noted, it's the expected, it is expected in ancient household codes to hear the master and slave relationship discussed. Yet the conventional pattern in this genre is for the guidance to be addressed to masters, not to slaves. In the Petrine code, masters are not addressed at all. And household slaves receive the longest discourse in the entire code. This marked feature of the Petrine domestic code points to a greater sense of agency for these slaves and even in the difficult situations they find themselves in. As Shively Smith notes, it is striking that 1 Peter does not address the master class at all. <laughs> 
The admonition to slaves begins like this. Slaves, submit in all fear to your masters, not only to masters who are good and tolerant, but to masters who are perverse. For this is commendable if, because of being conscious of God, someone endures pain when suffering unjustly. The situation of these slaves is intimated by the author's reference to submission even to slave owners who are perverse, not only to those who are tolerant. The author seems to be focusing here on slaves whose masters are not allowing for dissent as it relates to loyalty to the family's gods. This situation resonates with the admonition ahead to the Christian wives to submit to their husbands even if they are not believers, even if they are disobeying the gospel. Chapter 3, verse 1. These references suggest that some, and quite possibly many, of the Petrine households are divided in allegiance, with those with significantly less power in the system struggling to live out allegiance to Christ, even as their paterfamilias remained committed to his gods and his past way of life. This would have put these women and slaves in a precarious position in the household. It's no wonder then that the author devotes the bulk of the domestic code to these two groups. And it is no wonder that he presses the genre boundaries of his household code to provide these two groups with the agency to stay loyal to Christ. To the slaves, P Peter calls for submission to masters as he previously called his entire audience to submit to governing authorities. As we noted there, this is an unmarked feature of the code. That is, it's a conventional and so unremarkable moment. Submission in all fear would often be the safest pathway for slaves in response to masters who would assume compliance in all things. Certainly, unbelieving masters would expect adherence to their own religious allegiances from their slaves and would have no reason to be sympathetic to a slave's competing religious loyalties. And given the way slaves, male and female, young and old, were often treated by their masters, treatment that could involve physical, sexual, and verbal abuse, Peter provides active ways to combat white, what might simply be impossible situations. Specifically, he encourages slaves to do good and to endure even unjust suffering through their awareness of God. In these exhortations, the agency of these slaves is assumed and valued. They are given moral agency, something that is rather uncommon to give them in the philosophical discourse. In these exhortations, uh, as Smith um, proposes, the letter maintains a judicious distinction between household servants and masters, portraying them as independent decision makers within the traditional household. Just as the masters can be gentle or harsh, the servant can choose to do good or bad, again emphasizing agency. After giving these exhortations, Peter provides slaves the example of Jesus, who suffered injustice yet did not deserve that treatment and was also innocent of retaliation. Jesus lived out the good in an impossible situation. Notice that it was not the slave owner who receives the words about Christ's example, but slaves who are invited to follow in Christ's footsteps, 221. This is an, a tricky and interpretive and contextualizing moment in the letter, since it can be all too easy to press those with least power in a system to imitate Jesus and sacrifice themselves without any thought to issues of power and agency. Yet we should note that the vision of Jesus suffering injustice without returning violence could provide a keen sense of solidarity for these slaves who are suffering. As De Dennis Edwards writes, Jesus is the one who is in solidarity with the sufferer. We must also consider the very limited options of slaves in relation to masters who would not have approved of their slaves' newfound allegiance to Christ Within that range of limited options, seeking to be above reproach in their behavior by living out the good without compromising their loyalty to Christ could, could preserve their physical life. As Smith suggests, survival, not reprisal, appears to be the letter writer's priority. <laughs> 
Peter moves from addressing house slaves to directly communicating with wives and especially focusing on wives whose husbands are not part of the faith community, those husbands who are disobeying the gospel. What is eye-catching about this section is that wives are addressed directly and that they are addressed first and at length with a written word to husbands coming only in a single verse at the end of the domestic code in verse 7. As we noted with the direct address to slaves, this feature suggests greater, a, a greater amount of personal agency ascribed to those with less power in the household. Caroline Johnson Hodge identifies the tension implicit in this passage. Three, one to six, she writes, assumes a wife's agency precisely in her subservience. Look with me at verses one and two and then verse six of chapter three. We read, likewise, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if some of them are dis disobeying the gospel, they might be won over by the co wives' conduct without a word, by observing your reverent and holy conduct. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children if you continue to do, do good and do not fear any intimidation. The address to wives begins, similarly to the two previous sections, with an exhortation to submit, huputasso, to 13, 18, and 3, 1. As in the other two cases, the call to submission is the expected feature of the household code. So, in, and so it is an unmarked feature of the address to wives. In other words, the command for wives to submit to their unbelieving husbands would not have raised eyebrows in the first century context. Within verse 1, a marked feature is the stated purpose of the command to submit, that their husbands might be won over. In a context in which the family had made the decisions for the household, even and especially related to the family gods, the intention that women would be instrumental in their husbands' conversions is surprising and unconventional. Listen to philosopher Plutarch again in his essay, Advice to Bride and Groom. A wife ought not to make friends of her own, but to enjoy her husband's friends in common with him. The gods are the first and most important friends. Therefore, it is becoming for a wife to worship and to know only the gods that her husband believes in and to shut the front door tight upon all strange rituals and outlandish superstitions. It's worth pausing here to let this sink in. Plutarch represents the commonplace view that a wife will fully align her loyalties, human and divine, with her husband's loyalties. Quite differently, the author of 1 Peter speaks of the end goal as winning her husband over to her singular loyalty to Christ. As we read 1 Peter 3, 1, we should be struck by the countercultural mission expressed, not so much by the submission exhorted. The latter is expected in that time period and in that culture and would have blended into the background for the hearers. In bold relief, however, they would have heard the missional vision as extraordinary. The delicate nature of their mission, turning their husbands to Christ rather than returning to his gods, explains, I suggest, the wordless mission Peter commends, that they may be won over by the wives' conduct without a word, without a logos. Margaret MacDonald situates the dicey position these women are in when she writes, living on the crossroads between the church and the world, women who were married to unbelievers were especially susceptible to scrutiny from outsiders. First Peter 3, 1 through 6 gives us every reason to believe that these women were being treated with hostility by mates who may also have played a part in the slander of the community. The wordless mission of wives whose husbands are not believers sits in tension with the commendation to the mission Peter will soon give to the entire community in 315. Be ready at every turn to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, the logos, for your common hope. The wives are to give no logos and yet win the husbands, but the community is to give a reason, a logos for their common hope, the hope that they share together as a community. How do we make sense of this tension, or what Shively Smith calls the author's double vision at this point? 
I would suggest that in a cultural context where rejection of the gods of one's husband is simply socially unacceptable, silent rather than verbal witness is one way to minimize accusations against the gospel and the church while remaining true to the purpose of winning the unbeliever. As McDonnell suggests, the author of 1 Peter recommends prudence as the course of action for these wives. The rest of the direct address to wives confirms this path of prudence as the women pursue their carefully worked out mission. These wives of husbands who are not yet followers of Jesus are to act in ways through a focus on the qualities of submission and gentleness that will most effectively win their husbands to Christ. Verses two through five. In the final lines of the address to wives, we hear one possible ramification of these women staying true to Christ. Paul draws on the example of Sarah who obeyed Abraham calling him Lord and then assures these women that they are Sarah's children if they continue to do good and do not fear any intimidation. The reference to calling one's husband Lord, kurios, evokes the power differential between wives and husbands. Since a husband as pater familias could invoke his absolute authority whenever he wished. The power differential explains, I think, the strong language that follows about not fearing any intimidation. Peter here uses a combination of the typical verb for fear, phobeomai, with the more unusual and potent noun, ptoesis, expressing intimidation or even terror. In the situation being addressed, the most likely source of such intimidation is a woman's unbelieving husband. Coercion to renounce their allegiance to Christ would be the intimidation most close at hand for wives who had recently turned away from their husband's religious commitments. Yet Peter exhorts them not to fear their husbands, even if they would have very good reason to do so. The final turn of the domestic code briefly addresses husbands, and particularly any patres familias, heads of households, within the church family, so believers husbands who are believers, heads of households. The inclusion of 3.7 indicates there are heads of households in the Petrine house churches who are believers, even if it seems that the majority or at least a significant contingent of their members are from households with divided loyalties. As Jeanette Ock suggests, the singular address to believing husbands, meaning here the single verse in verse 7, strongly suggests that marriages between believers are the exception, not the rule. Ach goes on to say the brevity of 1 Peter's exhortations to husbands also reflects that the author's concern in 3, 1 through 6, is not with wifely submission, but conflictual relationships with their unbelieving husbands as a result of their obedience to Christ. So here's what Peter writes to husbands, to Christian husbands. Likewise, husbands, live with your wife in awareness that she is the weaker of the two of you, assigning honor to her as a co-inheritor of the gift of life. Do this so that your prayers might not, might not be thwarted. Peter exhorts these believing husbands to live with their wife with the recognition of her weaker position in family and society as the weaker of the two of you. The way they are to live out this awareness is by assigning honor since she is an equal heir of the life that God has imparted in salvation. This exhortation for husbands to grant their wives honor is noteworthy in the Greco-Roman context, where honor is a limited commodity and distributed quite unequally along the social strata. The Jewish philosopher Philo, for example, writes about the differences in honor due men and women and concludes that women, the woman is not equal in honor with man. Within the Petrine domestic code, a husband is to share honor with his wife and to esteem her as one who has equally received God's gift of salvation. The address to the husband concludes with the only warning within the entire domestic code. The author hinges divine attention to the prayers of these patres familias on obedience to the command to honor their wives. Their prayers will be thwarted if they neglect to honor and treat their wives as their equals in salvation. <laughs> 
our analysis of the Household Code of 1 Peter has illuminated various unmarked and so unremarkable features, as well as its marked or unusual characteristics. To conclude our exploration, take, let's take a look at the frame the author provides for the domestic code in 2, 11 through 12 and 3, 8 through 12. Although there's much we could say about how Peter frames the code, I'd invite you to notice the exhortations all the way across, bolded on the slide, to avoid evil and to do good. This simple pairing sums up quite well the frame of the household code. Staying the course to avoid evil, including any kind of retribution for the slander they are enduring, and to pursue good and righteous behavior provides an important lens for understanding the purpose of the Petrine Code. As we've seen in the details of the code, these Christians are to remain above reproach by pursuing good and never responding in kind to the slander of outsiders leveled at the community of faith. Yet, we, as we have also seen, their situation is complicated by their singular allegiance to Jesus Christ. There will be times when their behavior will look wrong, even evil, to those around them because of this singular loyalty. For example, when a woman does not worship the gods of her husband. We hear this kind of catch-22 in the opening frame in 2 verse 12. Make sure your conduct is honorable among the Gentiles so that when they accuse you of doing what is wrong, they will observe your good works and glorify God in the day of his visitation. That is, in the final day when God makes all things right. Ensuring their conduct is honorable, good, not bad, will not, it seems, keep these believers from being accused of wrongdoing in the present. There may very well be something in their behavior that will be offensive to the society among, among which they live. And this is especially true for those on the underside of power in the household and in the polis. The imbalance of power in their situations means those in authority over them may be viewing them as wrongdoers even as they are rightly living out their newfound loyalty to Christ and Christ's ways. Their behavior was not going to satisfy everyone. As Williams summarizes, Williams summarizes Peter's message to the Petrine churches, they were instructed to comply with the standards of popular society as a way of preserving the basic safety of the at most at-risk readers. Yet in each case, social conformity was balanced by some form of resistance, which cautiously challenged existing social structures and quietly asserted the insubordination of the author. In his use of the household code, Peter's message is this. With the gospel and the glory of God at stake, these believers should submit to human institutions whenever possible so that their only offensive behavior arises from their complete allegiance to Christ. By exploring the Petrine Household Code in light of the ancient genre form, we've been able to see the ways the author has nuanced and adapted traditional genre contours. While household codes typically endeavor to promote compliance and stability, the Petrine Code has been reshaped to help these Anatolian Christians survive in what seem to be precarious situations in which their allegiance to Jesus is causing them to be maligned and in some cases threatened. The marked features of the household code, the ones that would have stood out to its readers and hearers, include the exhortations for all believers to live as free people while being slaves of God and not the emperor, empire, for slaves to exercise their moral agency in pursuit of good and honorable behavior in impossible situations, for wives to stay true to their singular commitment to Christ even when experience intimidation, experiencing intimidation to return to the gods of their husband, and for husbands to share honor with their wives. These are all marked features of the code. These countercultural threads in the Petrine domestic code would have cautiously challenged existing social structures, as William suggests. As such, there is a kind of resistance offered in the code, which transgresses its typical patterns, parameters, and um, intended to promote conformity. Scholars routinely address this phenomenon, often with language that tries to get at the tension implicit, 
implicit in a resistant household code. Here are some ways they describe the resulting stance toward culture promoted in 1 Peter. A soft difference, a polite resistance, a holy nonconformity, and surviving the system despite the system. However we describe this tension, it is important for interpreting 1 Peter, including the domestic code within it, to reckon with the context of its advice to circumspectly confront the system. And the setting is this. 1 Peter offers the strategy of a thoughtful leader toward his beleaguered congregations as they are living between a rock and a hard place. Peter's goal was to help his audience circumspectly navigate the fine line between their two realities. He guides them toward conformity to cultural norms whenever possible and resistance when absolutely necessary so that they will remain true to Jesus Christ as the only Lord. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for some questions, and so if you have them, please let us know. Danny's going to be texting me any questions we get online, but if you have a question from our group in the room here, please feel free to ask. Glenn. Um, one of the marked features that you didn't point out is um, we see it in Paul especially, but we see it here in chapter 3 where Peter reverses the roles. So a Greco-Roman would never talk to the wife first and the husband second. It would always be uh, to the husband first and the wife second because that's the order. Um, so Paul does it with everyone. Yeah. Um, can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah I, I think you probably mentioned it incidentally, incidentally earlier on in terms of the order and then the length. I mean, I think the length <coughs> and the order together really are quite striking. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that, that slaves are addressed at all is very unusual. I think there are a couple of citations that Balsh gives, you know, that he's found somewhere, but they, it's very quite striking, or it's very striking that he, he does that. Um, so, yeah, I think the order is also important. Um, and masters not addressed at all, of course, means that it's just the household slaves. Yeah. No, I th that just compounds it more, even more so. Unlike in a normal Greco-Roman setting, you have all of these people together. It's not even as marked as in Paul, where you have children along with the, yeah. the wives and the women and, and others. Um, yeah, they're they're in a house church, and they're in house church settings where they're together in uh, whether. Uh, um, you could imagine a house church where there might still be some stratification, mm -hmm. but the press toward, and especially the dress toward, uh, those who have least power suggests that he's addressing house churches where there is this mix that's not, um, maybe not stratified in the way they meet as a house church. Yeah. Or even something that's not usually allowable. Yeah. That men and women and children are all together. They'll all be together. Being yeah, well. and that's something that happens in the family, but not, uh, you know, across family lines. And because, of course, Peter's highlighting this is a household of God. I mean, this this is family. So the the tendency for uh, them to view each other as family members would really um, sort of transcend those bound typical bound boundaries. I think that's right. And it's curious to think about the children in the. I was thinking more about the children in the, in the context because there's children there, right? They're not addressed directly. Um, but the children language is sort of exported into the whole letter. Uh, I, I just wonder about the vulnerability of the children in, in, the, in the context as well. I've been thinking about them even though they're not mentioned. Um, what would their experience be? Um, and McDonald nicely emphasizes that um, these wives would have had an impact um, not just on their husbands potentially, but upon children, of course, and potentially their slaves, you know, the kind of the mix of the group that they're, the, the call to win their husband, um, sort of implicitly, you win anybody else who's in the context. And that's often the way um, Christianity went in the first couple centuries, right? That wives, it was a religion thought to be uh, women, of women, you know, that was problematic for some people looking in. But women 
tended to convert their husbands. That's one direction the gospel went. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could comment on, um, just looking at the, the grammar here, um, with uh, imperatives being used kind of in the, um, the governing authority section, mm -hmm. and then um, participles as each subsequent group is introduced. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if um, what you make of that, um, and if we should consider perhaps um, 13 to 17 to be almost like a, a topic sentence of, sor of sorts for the entire um, Sex, household code as a whole. Yes, um, the the uh, the to the slaves, to the wives, to the husband. We we have these participles that keep the connection going. In other words, show that this is a thing that hangs together. Um, where you have in the initial section more imperatives, because that that's you have to have an imperatival sort of participle, a participle that functions like an imperative. You kind of need to have the imperative up front to follow. So, I mean, I don't know if I would hear it as a section that's supposed to then, you hang on to it all the way through. I mean, I mean certainly to some extent, because it's in that section that we hear about um, silencing these, these critiques. So there is something that's more general. It is to the larger group, the whole group. So I, I think there's some of that, yes. Um, but I don't know if that is, it's precisely in the grammar that we would see that. Um, but it does make sense that once you've had an imperative, um, then you can follow that with the participles. Likewise, slaves, likewise, or it, it actually starts, the likewise starts in 3.1 and then 3.7. Likewise, wise, likewise. So the, there's a variety of ways the whole section hangs together grammatically, and I think the participles and also the, the likewise language or the comparative um, probably helps it to, to hang together as a whole. Um, I don't know if that, okay. So on Father's Day, I, I preached on Ephesians 5, <laughs> and I used commentaries that said very similar things about the household code. Uh, I posted that sermon, and I got a Facebook message by um, somebody who, the female uh, Anabaptist pastor, mm -hmm. who gave this objection, and really kind of, what a plan. Okay, I'm going to think about this. <laughs> um, she characterized it this way. Jesus' way of the kingdom is a radical revolution from the way the world works. For her, pacifism over violence, mm -hmm. and we're just not going to engage with that anymore. And also for her, equality of women over uh, patriarchy. And she said, when, when she looks at these passages and the explanation I gave, she said, that seems like an accommodational strategy. Why wouldn't, if the church was willing to suffer, even be martyred, mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they just say, well, we're just going to resist this whole yeah. power structure entirely? Yeah, and um, First Peter is known for its tension between accommodation and distinctiveness. And, and there's even sort of internal fights by scholars on which one gets the prominence, which one, which one is happening more of the time. Um, the household code, just by its nature, is about conformity. So it's a sense of, it's more, in a sense, accommodationist, you could say. I was trying to pull out um, the marked features that help us hear how it's bending the form to, to not be fully accommodationist. But um, it helps me to think of the, this group of people, and I'm not trying to bring the same sort of social analysis of the Petrine audience into Colossians and Ephesians. I, you know, so I, I leave that to the scholars working in those books. But um, the situation is really testy for these believers. And you can walk through the letter and just kind of hear um, that they're being maligned um, at the very moment that they're being faithful to Jesus. And they can't quite get out of this quandary. And how do you do that? Well, you, you both accommodate and you, be, and you live distinctively when you have to and accommodate when you can. Um, I, I don't think early Christian writers necessarily thought um, we can get rid of patriarchy. I don't know, I mean, I don't know how they thought about this reality that was everywhere. So uh, they, 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 they tend to work within the system to overthrow the system, unless they're talking to the people with the most power. So when they talk to the people with the most power, that they tend to say the most radical things. Um, Paul to Philemon about slavery. I think that, and I think there's an implicit, you know, treat him 
uh, you know, more uh, more than a brother. I mean, let him go. Let it, you know, give him his freedom. That's what I hear kind of implicitly in Philemon. But when he's talking to the people on the underside, you don't tell them just go out and get out your sign and start marching. And you know, this it's a dangerous it's a dangerous situation there. And I think Shively Smith in her book um, *Strangers to Family* on First Peter really helps us to hear um, that this is not a uh, this is not a place to stick your neck out too far. Peter wants his people to survive. She, that's the language she uses. He wants them to, and, and the ones with the most power have the most power to affect the system, but it doesn't seem that in the Petrine audience, that's the majority. I mean, there's debate on how you read the language in 2.18 and 3.1 on and, and how many households are divided, but there's enough that it becomes a core feature of the household code, this divided reality that um, husbands or the heads of households um, are not, have not all been converted, and there are wives and slaves who want to be a part of the Christian community and have to figure out to do that, how to do that really, really, really carefully. And Travis Williams in his, his um, find the final, one of the final quotations talks about how Peter's strategy is to protect the most vulnerable. His household strategy is about protecting the most vulnerable as best as he can. And the slaves ones, the slave section always feels to me like I would have liked to hear more or different from Peter on that. Because it sounds like just be good, be good little slaves. And But, but again, um, Shively Smith talks about how there's a, an agency here that's being um, given back to the slaves, a moral agency. It's all they can do. Um, it's not terribly adequate. But in that context, it presses the boundaries of what is allowed and expected, and and you can remain true to your 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 one God, to Jesus Christ as Lord. That three fifteen is really important for me. In that set apart Christ in your lives as Lord. People will know about that, but you keep as quiet as you can in terms of making a big fuss, and you just remain loyal and. Um, and live and, get, and kind of keep the nose down and go. So it feels like the situation, uh, it's not just, oh, we can throw off these constraints. This is a very difficult situation. And again, I don't need to or want to read those situations into Colossians and Ephesians necessarily because we have these little slaves submit even if your masters are harsh, wives submit even if your husbands don't believe. Those are the only, those are features we only have in First Peter, not in Colossians, not in Ephesians. So I think we have a different situation here, at least in part, with some of the same, I think you can take some of the same currents or some of the same themes and, and the, the ways that the household code is reimagined across the three, but there are some unique pieces to First Peter that I think make it a little more dire. to uh, a question from our friends online. Can you comment on why Peter may have used different words for slave in 2.16 and 2.18? Yeah, he, um, he uses the language for a household slave. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, other than it, it may be in the cities where the, 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 the letter goes to these various cities and areas that, that they the majority of the slaves are, we, are the, within the household. I mean, it's just kind of a function who, of who showed up again, who's, uh, who he's writing to. So I'd, I'm not sure that he's trying to make a big distinction. Household slaves could be abused as easily as field slaves. I mean, they're just, it, it isn't a great thing to be in the first century world. Uh, and you don't have agency to, to stop what happens to your what your master tells you you have to do. So um, I don't see a big distinction here, but um, that'll be one of my questions as I move into working on my first Peter commentary that will be due in a few years. And as I kind of take this work and start to think about how to comment on every verse, you notice I could comment more selectively in my time tonight. So, so I'm not sure I no, have a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, gentleman with the yeah. blue shirt. So uh, the, the passage uh, that, that we were looking at tonight um, doesn't have a fathers and child um, pairing. Right. But Peter does come back to uh, maybe this concept at, at near the end of his letter when 
when he talks about yeah. the, the elders you know, being an example, not mm -hmm. lording it over their flock, but yeah. you know, and then and then saying, you know, younger people, you should mm -hmm. submit to the elders, you know, and, and be humble because God likes that essentially. Yeah, yeah, so, so, the, so, so the, the leaders and followers that he, he gives a, a little household of the faith, right, in chapter 5. No, I think that's a really important point that he kind of comes back to that. Um, he talks to the elders in 5, 1 through 4, and then in 5, in the same way, he uses that same um, comparative to help tie these two together. In the same way, you who are younger... I used to think of followers and leaders a little bit more here. Submit yourselves to your elders. So there's, it's a, a mini household code for the household of faith, and there's just two categories, really. Those who lead, who are to lead very sacrificially, right, not for gain, and then those who are to follow. And they're all to humble themselves. Um, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. So there's a really egalitarian impulse there that shows the family of God um, much less contested space. You know, this is... He can talk about this, and the, the community um, can follow these guidelines, and it's pretty easy, I don't know if it's easy to enact, but it can be enacted without this other kind of current going on where even some of um, the greatest um, enemies of the Petrine congregation might be some of the husbands of some of these wives. They might be the ones slandering the community. That's McDonald's suggestion. Uh, to at least consider that possibility, that would be really tricky, wouldn't it? So, but yes, that's a wonderful place to come back to household language um, and household vision, kind of vision for the household of God. And 417, again, has that language of the household, house of God or household of God. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. It really does permeate the whole le letter in some ways, yeah. I'm more familiar with Paul than I am with, um, with Peter's household codes. One of the things I've noticed with Paul, not only does he do the reversal, which I think mm -hmm. is subversive, but um, he also, because the power structure is important for the Greco-Romans, it's all about who rules and who is ruled. Um, Paul replaces power with love, so husbands love your wives rather than rule your wives. Do you think that Peter is replacing power for, by honor? Because he says, um, honor, the, honor everybody, Honor the emperor, husbands, honor your wife. Yeah. I, I think that, that is an important motif in the household code. Yeah, and, and love is reserved for the community, 1, um, 21 through 25, and 4, 7 through 11. There's two little moments where uh, the internal workings of the community sh uh, are addressed. And to love one another deeply, um, though the theme of love comes up only those two places in the letter. So it's a family of God. It's a, it's a different family now that you have yes within the within the families the existing biological families or relational family households honor is a key a key idea I think that's very true I think that that'll be helpful to me thank you <laughs> so yeah um, yeah with love being the the glue that holds the Christian community together yeah For Paul, that, that right yeah I hadn't thought about that that comparison yeah. as much yeah certainly honor I'd like to ask a question. If Absolutely. That's okay. um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, the community rule from Qumran. And obviously the household codes, I said it right that time, um, and uh, the community rule, are, they're very different things. But you talked about identity formation. Mm. And that's exactly what's going on at Qumran with the community rule. And abstaining from evil and outside influences mm -hmm. and uh, I just wonder if you've given that any thought or you know of anyone who's given that any thought and I'm having deja vu from our conversation from Tuesday if we touched on that briefly forgive me yeah, if I no. forget the details um, well and um, Peter really um, hits hard community formation in chapter 2 4 through 10 right before the household code so it's really helpful to think of those um, in conversation he talks about how they've been built up as living stones into this temple structure. He doesn't talk, use language of temple, but it's clearly a temple. Um, and they're the people of God, and he uses language from Exodus. Um, but you were once, and from Hosea, you were not, once not a people, now you're the people of God. Um, and they're royal priesthood, um, holy nation. Um, so he uses all of the key um, Old Testament uh, 
language uh, terms for the people of God and, and gives them to these primarily Gentile believers. I think there are probably Jews in the community as well, but I think they're primarily Gentiles from the clues across the letter. So you have this really significant um, grounding of their identity. And then the household code, I think, um, helps them kind of take that and figure out how to live it on the ground um, in these really contested kind of places. Um, so I don't know if that gets at what you're saying, but that, that identity formation, and they're, the sl- the, they're, they're exiles and they're um, uh, uh, sojourners. I think that's the language I prefer for those two terms that show up in 1-1, 117, 2 11. That identity as one who is not at home here, mm-hmm. and then you have a household code. You know, so I think there's a lot that's being played on there in terms of identity and and how do you then live in this place that's not really fully home now in your household? Mm-hmm. Um, is that? Yeah, that, that? No, that's helpful. Um, I wonder, you know, the, the differences would be as important as the similarities, yeah, yeah. obviously. But if we run with McDonald's suggestion that it's potentially husbands mm-hmm. who are maligning the community, that's, that's a, a very interesting kind of counterpoint to what's going on in Qumran because if somebody dare says anything bad about the community mm. you it, it's lights uh, out you you, yeah. you you distance yourself yeah. from them in an extreme way so anyway just yeah. uh, we'll have to have more conversations sure. and I would sure. yeah that's just amazing to think about those connections many other questions John I'm just wondering to what extent the framing subverts the roles in the yeah. sense regardless of your role especially the one after, you know, sympathy, humility, mm-hmm. tender hearts, loving, pursuing yeah. peace, being a blessing. So if you added all those, whatever your role, be a blessing type of yeah. person in that role, be a humble person in that role, be, so that almost, regardless of how you frame the role societally, mm-hmm. this virtue, these sort of Christ-like yes. virtues, frame the role in a totally different subversive way. And I'm just wondering to what extent this, the sort of the framing changes how we actually view any role. Yeah, yeah and I, I do think the fr- we need to hear the framing. And the, the front end shows the problem, right? It's like um, be so exemplary in your behavior so that even while they're maligning you, you will, you know, they will come to know that you are actually doing good. It's this one of the contested things, uh, questions in First Peter is, um, are there really good works they can do that would satisfy those folks around them, or really not, in the very doing of their good works, i.e. allegiance to Jesus, they're going to look like they're completely off the mark in terms of moral compass to those around them. And um, that's a debate that kind of is going on at present. Um, I I tend to lean toward they're just not going to ever quite win. It is that kind of community. So that's the front frame. And then the end frame is this powerful virtue list, and then Psalm 34, which the author uses across the letter, different points, um, to talk about, you know, keep your lips pure. I mean, so again, back to pure behavior and good behavior and good conduct keeps on, or honorable conduct keeps on showing up throughout the letter. So even at the end, you have both of these things. And and now I'm really curious to think about how how do we hear both of those, these powerful virtues, Christian virtues that are about deferring to the other and caring for the other um, and then this sense of be exemplary because it's the only way you're going to make it through yeah so I mean t- holding those together eight and nine and ten through twelve um, but the frame I think the frame is crucial to to kind of hearing how the how there's both sort of subversion but also I think there's just there's a amount of accommodation an amount of accommodate an amount of accommodation that I can't get away from you know in the household code it's not this um, let's throw off all the shackles kind of thing it, there's there's a testy tension it's you know those final Miroslav Volf soft difference David Harrell um, what did he call it polite resistance and then Shively Smith you know sort of somehow getting around the system when the system's still in place sort of thing. You know, those, those kinds of, that kind of language shows up in all of the writing on First Peter because it's this really hard place to be. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't know if I answered anything you just said, but. Follow up with that. How would you respond to someone I've seen sort of pastorally, tragically, some of the household codes yeah. used to justify perpetuating abuse within yes. the family, for example, yeah. and just with horrific implications for the yeah. people experiencing that. And, and I think, I wonder whether a flat reading of that and missing some of the contracts yeah. you're talking about actually are used to justify that. But yeah. based on your reflections on this particular household code, how would you respond to somebody who almost uses this as a way to justify um, yeah. Yeah. continuing abuse within the family? This tells you to submit, yeah. win over your husband, right. It'll take time. And, and pointing it out, out its you know, grounding in its context is 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 the safe, sa safe in a good way, safe hermeneutical move to say we've got to understand in its context, because such scary things could happen with this absolutely. And um, uh, the sense that, um, that going back to the marked features, it's why a land on it's so hard. You know, to to say submit. To your husbands, I mean, that's there, there's no eyebrows raised. It's it is the unmarked thing in that context. So here at first in that context, and they go, but what's uh, what's marked is the winning your husbands. This is a this is a a bold move. And if you you take it today and kind of just sloppily kind of lay it against whatever context you want, that means there are other. I mean, there are contexts around the world where this lands a bit differently. Um, and it could help, it could also be viewed, it can kind of open things up a bit, like I think it did in the Petrine house, uh, Petrine communities. But if you just simply, like you say, do a flat reading or simply move into another context, and you think the marked thing is submit, because that's the marked thing for us, right? Submit, you're like, ah! You know, so, I mean, we hear that, we just go, ah, that's marked. But that's not the marked moment. So to really pay attention to that, I think is hermeneutically crucial to notice what's marked and what's not marked. And that doesn't just wash away that text, but it does help us to hear the point of it. What is Peter doing with it? He's not saying, I'm going to tell you something brand new. It's really radical, and you're not going to like it if you're a woman, and that is submit to your husbands. Yeah, you know, that, that's not at all what's going on, right? Um, he, he's saying, I'm going to tell you something radical. It's new. It's going to freak you out, but win your husband over. And you know the best way to do that? Without a word. Because I know you're in a dangerous place. That's okay. Um, Rodney Stark, um, yeah. probably familiar with him. So he he took a, you know a sociological look at the rise of early Christianity, yeah. Jesus and the rise of early Christianity. I think, yeah. um, and he talks about this passage as a place that kind of gives us a sociological insight into the rapid growth of Christianity because on the whole women are more religious, spiritual than men and they, they have, a, um, they have a, a greater role over the upcoming generation too. So you have this yeah. rapid rise. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, in a sense, what, what Peter said here you know, it panned out. <laughs> it panned yeah. out the growth it's, of the early it church. It worked. The strategy worked. Yeah. Even, Even though, though it's, it's a, a very... very strategy right it's, it did work yeah I, I actually cite some of his work I, I have a couple articles journal articles on first Peter and I use some of his work to say you know to, to just point to that trajectory that women brought their husbands to faith I mean it's not the only way it happened and it certainly was easier when heads of households were converted first because they just said we're all going this direction you know, and then everybody went that direction, you know, and the next generation, it kind of probably worked or something. I don't know if it always worked in the first generation, but. Total speculation, but I wonder if the reason why Peter didn't address children is because they're now contested space. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can talk to fathers yeah. about their children in a Christian context, yeah. but when you have a non-Christian yeah. father, uh, the children are supposed to be deferring to him. They're, the pattern of is supposed to be over them, but yeah. Peter actually wants the women to yeah. socially raise them in the faith. Yeah. Which, Which knows will happen. That is their primary, or more primary domain, depending, you know, they're doing a lot of different things, but that's one thing they're doing, yeah. raising the children, yeah. It is interesting to think about the children that aren't mentioned, I mean, that are there. I, I do think that's an interesting place to kind of spend some time thinking about 
um, why he doesn't address them. Uh, I think there are probably a, multi a number of reasons, potentially. Yeah. One more question. Um, do you think that there's a, I can't help but wonder if there's a hierarchy in the verbs that he uses, because he uses, he says, fear God. Yes. I mean, obviously that's the highest. Mm -hmm. um, he'll use that again later and say, you know, so your husband will see your fearful way of living. Yeah. In other words, they're fearing of God. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have honor, yeah. honor the Caesar. I would think that's fairly high just under God, yeah. Yeah. which then places uh, uh, submission to your husband and yet a lower rung. Uh -huh. In other words, it seems to me yeah. that there's layers of this mm -hmm. type of deference, and God the gets the greatest. Right. Caesar should too, but not as high. Your husband's yes. even less so. It's not, so it's actually moving the husband down in the ladder. Yeah. For, for yeah, that yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's a helpful observation. And the tricky thing about Phobos is um, the slaves are to submit in fear in all reverence i mean because you can translate phobos reverence and fear but it feels it is interesting to look at it all the way through and go yeah but that one to me feels real it's like oh yeah that would be a scary thing to try to buck any part of the master's agenda and if i'm doing that because i'm a christian and they're not um it, you're, it's just a tricky place so fear makes sense there but it doesn't fit the, uh, sort of the hierarchy real well because yeah, yeah, I know. But, but I mean, I do think it's yeah. fair to say how is, that language is very pliable. Fabas or Fobas is very pliable. Um, and it can mean a variety of different things depending on who it is we're talking about. And clearly fear of God is an important theme in First Peter. So that's no question there. So, but I still have to figure out what the 218, 219 one is doing precisely. Uh, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that this approach, I mean, Peter is trying to say, here's how you can survive given the situation we are in. This is our world, power structures. Do you think Peter and Paul, are they being subversive as well? Yes. I mean, I think they're, they're balancing um, a struggling little Set, and whether there's a sect or not, but you know, a struggling little movement um, that that's not that I can't imagine they thought this was going to change the world precisely, at least in their lifetime. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what they think about that, but this idea of we're going to somehow overthrow slavery, even if we think we should do that. I mean, did did Peter think slavery should be eliminated? I I, I don't know how we know those things. I know he deals with real slaves, you know, real people, and gives them exhortations, but it's hard to know how they conceived this thing would work. So um, given that I don't know that, it's hard to kind of imagine, but they, I think they are subversive and they are concerned about the gospel and about the honor of God, God's honor. Um, and those things, you know, have a really high value. I mean, th you know, if you have to, in the end, lose your life because you are faithful to God, and you won't, you know, you you won't say no to Christ. You won't deny Christ. Then that's the way it goes, and we see that happening in you know um, Pliny's letter to Trajan, second century, early second century, Asia Minor. This is right where this is all happening, and um, the governor's concerned about having to put, to, you know, he has to put some, some people to death, some Christians, because they won't. Deny. He says, I can, get, I can get some of them to deny Christ, but some of them are really obstinate. And, and so you see it kind of working out that this, it, it is really, the stakes are very high. Whether you date, you know, wherever you date First Peter in the, in, the later, in the last half of the first century somewhere, um, depending on authorship, all that stuff, which I don't think really is, by the second century we have this really significant um, persecution. And here, at this point, it's more verbal, more verbally focused. You can hear that across the letter. But I do think I'm coming to see that it, it, you know, the threat to various members of the community could be much higher depending on who they are and what little power they have. I don't know. I didn't, I'm not answering questions real well, but I'm saying a lot. So <laughs> telling you more about what I think of First Peter. If it's, subversive, it's, it's not endorsing this is God's 
ordering, but rather it's undoing yeah. the order. Yeah, yeah. So in that way, yeah. In that way, uh, it's certainly subversive. Subversive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great questions. Um, I'm going to sit down. Right. Okay, you can do that. Did you have something to add? Peter may not have addressed the master class, but we just got a master class on First Peter. <laughs> that makes up for household cold. I can't even say it now. Household cold. I, I, I appreciate you identifying with me on that, uh, Janina. That's very good. Um, we thank uh, Dr. Brown for these great lectures. I thank you for coming. And um, as we celebrate... Uh, Hayward this year. We look forward to next year, 2023. Danny said, make sure you write click on the piece of paper. I've done that, so there we go. The Redemption of the Land, Rethinking the Place of Salvation with Dr. Willie James Jennings from Yale Divinity School. Stay tuned, October 2023. That concludes this year's lectures. Thank you for coming, and God bless.